Welcome to Zen Vesting Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Templeton. Let's start exploring. Hi, and welcome to the Zen Vesting Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Templeton, and I'm thrilled to welcome today my guest, Amit Wadwani of Morris Capital Management. Amit is portfolio manager and co-founding partner at Morris Capital Management and the founding manager of the Morris Worldwide Value Fund. Mr. Wadwani has over 26 years of experience researching and analyzing investment opportunities in developed, emerging, and frontier markets worldwide and has managed global investment portfolios since 1996. Prior to founding Morris, Mr. Wadwani was a portfolio manager and partner at Third Avenue Management with Marty Whitman. Mr. Wadwani founded the international business at Third Avenue and was the founding manager of the Third Avenue Global Value Fund the 3rd Avenue Emerging Markets Fund, and the 3rd Avenue International Value Fund, an open-end mutual fund. Welcome, Amit. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you very much for having me this morning. So I'd like to start our interview today by getting to know you just a little bit better. Um, Where did you grow up? I grew up in India, uh, in the United States and in Canada. I grew up, my, my high school years were spent in India. I went to university initially in the United States, moved to Canada where I, I worked as well as I studied as well. And then, of course, I think uh, things, uh, there was almost a circle. I came back to the U.S. to study, I returned to Canada, and then I moved to the United States to work with somebody I admired enormously, Marty Whitman. Amazing. And what area in India did you grow up in? <laughs> I grew up in the big city, well, the, then the biggest city, of course, it still is, uh, Mumbai, then called Bombay. Um, mm-hmm. So that was where I was born and brought up. I have been there. It's a, it's a fabulous place. What do you think growing up in India and having that experience has added to your investment philosophy? Ooh, um, so, um, gro- well, first, first of all, growing up in multiple countries, and in this case, growing up in the in, 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 in India, then the United States. I moved here when I was 16 years old, going to university here, then going going to Canada, working there. You you get a multi-country perspective of growing up. You straddle many different languages, cultures, and you develop a certain sensitivity and under, hopefully understanding to how different countries and cultures stick. I mean, Canada and the United States, people think of them as synonymous. They're not. They really are not. They're rather different countries. I mean, there's very, very different things, I mean, culturally, that drive both the politics, economics, economic policies, and so forth. The other, the other thing is, once you are comfortable learning about other cultures, you, 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 you come with a different kind of baggage. Now, just, just if I could, just if I could dwell on this for a second. Some years ago, I was at uh, Google giving a sp- talk about value investing there. And this is a value investment club at Google. Now, what was interesting was the, the, uh, a number of members of the value investment club were born in India, grew up in India, studied in India. But the India that they grew up in was a vastly different India than I grew up in. The world that I grew up in in India, this is though you're talking, I left India in 1970. So it was an India which was sort of very, if you will, dirigist. It was run by the government, top down. The government dictated exactly how everything would be. The banks had been nationalized and so on and so forth. You didn't have private banks then uh, to speak of. The bulk of the banking assets were in the nationalized public sector banks. And so that was the India we grew up in. We had ration cards. You didn't have uh, deregulated agricultural prices and so on and so forth. So that was the India that I grew up in. There was an India where government held sway and could do all sorts of things. It was a great place. The education was fabulous. And it was culturally, it was very, very appealing. I mean, in many, in many ways, it was, a, it was a wonderful place to have grown up. And I have many, many very fond memories of having grown up there and the people I grew up with. Fast forward, there's another generation. The generation grows up in a world where, you know, 
it's a much freer society, economically speaking. The world has changed enormously. There's been a fair amount of deregulation, although, I mean, you know, as you saw in the recent past, for deregulating agriculture has obviously caused all sorts of angst and tooth and gnashing going on in India. But that said, the, the world that they grew up in was a very different world. So it's a kind of world where the skies tend to be blue. And there's a huge long runaway for things getting better and better and better and better. And what this does, when you think about valuations, when you think about as, a, as an investor, I as an investor you know, worry about, how should I say, protecting my capital, protecting my investor's capital. On their, I, their view of the world is the horizons are boundless, growth is boundless. It is, I mean, it, just in a sort of very funny way, I could compare Benjamin Graham and Warren Buffett's views of the world. You know, Warren, ben Graham grew up in a much harsher environment, in a much tougher, in a post-World World War II and post-World War II environment. Warren Buffett's world is a world where there, it has been growth and tremendous growth. I mean, in great part, I mean, this country has had, uh, has been very conducive to growing and building businesses and has been very conducive to developing businesses. So it's a very, very different. So there are two sort of mindsets. So the value investor, the sort, my ilk, sort of is an earlier stage sort of person. I mean, tiptoe as I might uh, gingerly to learn how to do it the the new age kind of investing but certainly it it definitely influences the way you think about the world yes I have also um, met the value investing club at Google and gone there to give a presentation Um, you know I, I mean India was one of the top performing markets in Asia last year. And I note that you do have some holdings in India. Are you still positive on India, given the recent um, performance of stocks in India? So uh, if you look at stocks in India on a top-down basis, in an aggregate market price basis, it's an extremely expensive place. It's extremely, it's probably one of the most expensive markets in the world. Um, Now, you had to parse through that sort of, we don't own the market per se. Historically, the large cap companies which constitute the bulk of the index were always very expensive. So it always looked expensive. But below that, there were opportunities for stock pickers. There always have been. Now, there are more and there are less. Now, the way we invest, for better or for worse, is it's sort of our kind of value investment I don't want to, I'd call it a discipline. Some people call it a straight jacket. It's, it's really very, very rigid in some ways. It's very, it's very disciplined. So it has to be terribly, terribly cheap on a here and now basis. And that occurs sporadically. We had that opportunity in spades in 2020. We actually had such an opportunity, I think in late 2019 even, but 2020 was when we found a bunch of things to do. We own most of those things. We are, these are these are the three companies. Uh, uh, with in the, in the, this is now I'm going to refer to the portfolio of the fund. Uh, the three financial companies. One is a holding company, Bajaj Holdings and Investments. Uh, then there's a company called Edelweiss Financial, which is really a multi. It's a financial services company with different sort of um, uh, arms. It be insurance, life and non-life. It is a non-bank financial company, a mortgage banking company, and a capital markets, brokerage business. Uh, all it has been completely separated, have joint venture partners. The thing will split up into pieces uh, going uh, probably the next year or two. A, a company can, it might remind you of is IIFL. You probably are familiar yeah. with that company. That, that, see, that, it's very much the sort of prototype. It's just a much earlier stage IIFL. So mm-hmm. there's that. And the third one uh, we own is a company called um, – IDFC First Bank. It's really a putting together of a non-bank finance company and a regulated banking company. Now, this might seem like too much of the same or more of the same, but what's important is non-bank finance companies cannot take deposits. Uh, so the cost of funding is actually quite high. On the other hand, NBFCs tend to be, uh, oh, more enterprising in how they, uh, the, the assets are, for example. They engage in a lot of consumer lending, be it uh, used car, scooter, two-wheeler, uh, small trucks, um, sm- the small and medium-sized businesses and so forth. Whereas the funding costs 
if you were a bank, are very low. So the idea is to put the two of these two things together, have a deposit gathering base, expand it, and you have the lending, which is, um, uh, shall we say, a much higher margin, higher yielding le- uh, asset. So uh, that is a third company. And that's sort of been a work in progress in the sense that the two merged and the, the banking network was still being built out. And mm-hmm. meanwhile, of course, in the short term, obviously you have costs. Then, of course, COVID hit. So uh, you really haven't seen the, all the benefits of the integration of the two businesses, the full build out of the network. And you also had the short term hiccup relating to uh, COVID related loan losses, which are inevitable. So uh, uh, those are three things we own in India uh, in the mutual fund. Uh, so, yes. Excellent. Well, thanks for sharing that information with me. I want to go back to something you said at the beginning of the interview, that you had the opportunity to go work for someone that you admired greatly as a young person, and that would be Marty Whitman. I have also admired Marty for a very long time and was so sorry to learn of his passing. Um, Can you please reflect on your time at Third Avenue and share any important investment lessons you learned or just special memories that you have? Sure. I mean, there's a number of years uh, from start. So I encountered Marty in 19, through his writings in 1979. I had not met the, met the gentleman. I'd, I'd, I wasn't aware who Marty Whitman was. In fact, the book, uh, you may have heard of the book, is called The Aggressive Conservative Investor. It was, it was, his co-author was a gentleman by the name of Martin Schubig, Professor Martin Schubig at Yale, an economist, who I knew about. Martin Whitman, I never heard about. I didn't know who this man was. However, Martin Schubig, I rather respected. Um, and so I read the book. And I, was, I was completely, I, 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 was, I was hooked, for lack of a better word. I was really, I said, gosh, this is smart. It's common sense. And that's how one should be investing. Now, being mindful of that point in time in 79, um, I had never been to business school. I had never I hadn't studied accounting. So some of it was somewhat mysterious and opaque to me. That said, some years later, I did go to business school. In, 80, in 82, uh, it suddenly made even more sense to me, notwithstanding the fact that the university in question uh, certainly was not a proponent of this kind of investing. It was a great proponent of efficient markets and the right. like. And this is Chicago. So yeah. uh, you know, the irony was I've got Chicago and I'm even more, uh, shall we say, I will use the word wedded, but I'm certainly more um, – the, this style of investing appeals. It, it seems more and more common sense to me. Mm-hmm. That said, I had the opportunity, my path crossed uh, with MJ Whitman uh, completely by happenstance, and I became the customer, I became the client. Uh, although, although this is the broker dealer, which, which was a precursor to Third Avenue. That was in 84. So I had sort of I watched at that point only the, the broker dealer existed. And I had a chance to watch you know, firsthand how investing was being done. It was largely a special situation, bankruptcy distressed kind of investment firm. And they were, I mean, quite, quite, quite amazing. Uh, they, were, they were amazing then. And of course, the investment style developed. And I don't want to use the word morphed over the years. So I'll, I'll come to that in a second. So I joined them in 1990. So pre-1990, from 79 onwards, there was some familiarity in it built over time. I joined them in 1990, and I was there in two – In two, there were two stints. The first one was five-plus years, and the second one was 15-plus years. Wow. And uh, over those years, you certainly, certainly do get to know uh, how a person thinks. You, know, cl- you close up, you get to see how a person thinks. And again, it was, ne- it was never a very large firm. It was initially quite a small firm. It became larger over time. But uh, certainly initially, it was a very, very small firm. And there was probably less than 20, 25 of us, if that. I mean, if that. Um, I mean, what sort of notable things? I mean, one, I mean, I think about, uh, you know, Marty was strictly long-term. He was very, very long-term. He was absolutely disinterested in doing anything for the short term. Now, just to give you a sense of, I mean, uh, what this does, you the nature of your analysis focuses on the long term, how you approach and think of your investment, which in terms of the actions, your how you implement, that is to say you will not trade in the short term, for example. So, so day-to-day stock price moves, just he was uh, it's impervious to them. He was impervious to them. And to some degree, I think that was, um, how do I put it? Um, 
his background, as I mentioned, was in bankruptcy investing. In bankruptcy investing, security prices swing wildly. The, you can be have things go up twenty and thirty percent in a given day. And it's quite it's quite crazy. Uh, and so, in that sense, you know, this was well, you know. Who knows? He just dismissed it as calling abnormal psychology at work and go on. He would not right. you know, be fussed. What was important, of course, you know, so um, his focus was on absolute value, not relative value. And that's important because with absolute value, you have the comfort of buying something terribly cheaply. Now, I mean, the terribly cheap, the terrible cheapness can come with all sorts of factors and issues and reasons why things are terribly cheap. Terribly cheap. We will get to that. I mean, there's all sorts of things that cause every loss of discomfort. But if you become comfortable owning something that's terribly cheap and is very cheap, you, you don't really care whether, you know, it has an earnings miss and goes down some more and so on and so forth. So, but that's an important characteristic because that allowed him to invest for long periods of time, for long periods of time. Um, what else? I mean, um, the other thing, um, this is also how you think about investing. Um, as a bankruptcy investor, you think of yourself as a claimant. Okay, so if you own debt, senior debt, you're up further up on the totem pole, or if you own junior debt or preferred shares, you're further down. And if you want to, you can extend this mindset to think about equity securities in that as an equity security holder, you are the junior most claimant at the bottom of the heap. And so if you think in those terms, uh, you will know where you are in the pecking order, what your claim to the assets is, and so forth. So from that evolved, I suppose, what he used to call the primacy of the balance sheet. The primacy of the balance sheet rather than earnings, an earnings-based focus. And the pri- that was, a very, it was key to his security selection. That has had it left an imprint on us at MERS. We think of ourselves as more prone to an asset-based approach to security selection. It's very much like that, very, very much like that. I mean, there's, there's a number of things that Marty taught us. And I say us because the founders of MERS, the three of us, had spent a decade together at Third Avenue before we started MERS. So, uh, so there is a matter of... Uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, the asset-based investing. What other things, what other fact f- features could I mention uh, that could be interesting? Um, you know, he was, as I mentioned, uh, the prim- I mentioned the primacy of the balance sheet, earnings, short-term earnings, and even worse, short-term earnings growth. He was, uh, I, I don't want to use the word oblivious to, he was indifferent to. And I, I think if, if, a, if a, a budding analyst uh, who presented an idea to him at a research meeting, talked about earnings, earnings growth, he would tell them that said person was better suited to go and work at Merrill Lynch <laughs> or some, something like that. He would say that. I mean, in not such uh, gentle terms, but he would say it is also gravelly way. He said, you know, this is not for us. You really should be doing this pitching this idea at Merrill Lynch or somewhere, so on and so forth. But, sure. you know, so... Um, his focus you know, on the long term reminds me of my uncle, John Templeton, who used to say, Lauren, I'm trying to think about the best place to keep my foundation's assets over the next 200 years. <laughs> so, so, you know, so very so long term horizon and very unique to today's market. But I'm glad that you brought up the discount to NAV approach that you use at Morris. Um, You clearly have enormous skills, a really strong background in both traditional value methods and international markets. In the U.S. market, where investors are still currently paying over 20 times sales for more than 700 stocks, I think we counted uh, 711 stocks this week trading at a price to sales over 20 times in U.S. markets. you know, the value skill set has been a little bit out of step with uh, recent investor euphoria for tech stocks. Tell us about the patience needed and the discipline needed for you oh. to execute your discount to NAV approach and how you access the mental discipline to stay on course. So, you know, in investing in deeply discounted valuations, it's an activity that demands patience. I mean, as, as I said before, there's a reason why things are cheap. Does it, and if it was as easy as just snapping your fingers 
these things, or there's a proximate event that eliminates these discounts, these things would probably not be that cheap. Uh, and they wouldn't stay cheap. And the, the, the degree of cheapness would not exist. And of course, the rates of return, the result in buying things very cheaply would not be obtained over time even. So, so that, that's, that's very important. I mean, usually there are factors that cause this. There could be company-specific factors. There could be industry, fa- industry factors related to the company and business at hand or the geography. Or there could be some sort of capital markets event, like, a la, for example, the Eurozone crisis that we had some years ago. I mean, you always had stuff out there that causes these things. But usually if you find something cheap enough uh, on our asset-based metrics, we, what, we, what we do is we try to think about, I don't want to use the word, is there a path? Is there a path? How, does the, how do these things that are overhanging the company dissipate over time? The factors that have been depressed in the stock price, what is it that is causing these, the, 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 comp- the stock price to be depressed? And what sorts of things would cause this, the, 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 these factors to abate over time? Very often, there are things, you know, as I mentioned, I alluded to industry-related issues. I mean, you, you also keep an eye on the industry if there's something that's happening that causes it to abate or there's something company-specific. Has Is the company doing something specific to fix its problems, maybe a balance sheet problem, uh, fix its uh, operational problem? There's all sorts of things. But we, along the way, we always want to see progress in the development of a business, progress in enhancing the value, realizing value, some of the value. I mean, there's always something, you have a sense of progress. So forget the noise around you, the noise being these expensive stocks, which of course, you know, I mean, look, there's lots of gratification people derive from watching stock go up every day. And usually, very often the things that go up are things that are in fashion, that are being bid for and so on and so forth. But we don't own that. I mean, the, the, that, that's really a sideshow, a major distraction. Our focus really more is on w- watching what we own, watching carefully, watching like hawks, trying try to understand what has happened around it that's causing things uh, to change, what progress is made along the way to realization uh, of value or enhancement of value. Again, as I said, this is not in, this is not exciting in the short term. It is something that uh, you sort of plug through, you live through. Sometimes it's gratifying, sometimes it's not. But on balance, I mean, it's, it's something, if you own a business, and which is what we think of ourselves as owners of businesses or parts of businesses, it's a very important thing to watch what your business is doing and know it. And uh, mm-hmm. it takes patience. I mean, look, uh, let, let, let me not, let, let me not understate this will demand patience. And uh, for sometimes uh, along the way to the business building value, something happens to that causes the stock to, I don't want to say crash, but to go down sharply. And you have to be ready for that sort of thing. So in the short term, you have all sorts of periods of adversity that will hit you. But as long as the underlying progress is happening and is maintained, I, that, that is sort of what keeps us, I don't want to use the word sane, but keeps us on track. You know, right. it, it's a real reason for owning something and continue to own something. It, you develop and maintain conviction based on your level of detailed research, it sounds like. Exactly. You do learn a lot about the company before. You know, the, the, in terms of how we do our analysis, there's a lot of fixed cost, the learning about a business that you encounter before you spend the first dollar. And that is, you know, when I, I try to explain to people, that is when your risk control happens. You are mm-hmm. choosing to, you have a choice. You can set a cash, or you can invest in the security. When you invest in the security, you're taking on all kinds of things, risks, things positive and negative, you're taking on attributes of the business. You should know them and know them well. Now, with the passage of time during the period of your ownership, many things change. And the, the, you know, the impact of the company can also be quite, you know, it, 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 you, you'll see it over time. So you do need to keep an eye on that. And you should learn how your company is evolving over time. Mm-hmm. You know, the, that's, it's, it's, it gives you sort of a level, I suppose. You know. I mean, you sound like such a disciplined person. And I'm always fascinated with how investment managers structure their day. Can you tell me a little bit about how you structure your, your day? I mean, what are you doing when you, when you hit the office every day? So, I mean, fairly early in the morning, well before 
anything related to the office. So uh, I am currently in this, this room here is, is my, my home office, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we, we, it starts fairly early in the morning because being mindful that we invest around the world, uh, when I go to bed, Asia is up and running. And, uh, you know, the last market to open usually in Asia is India. But more recently, actually, uh, we have investment in the United Arab Emirates. So that's really the last one, the, 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 the latest market to open. I'm usually about to go to bed by then, which is this after midnight. It used to be 2 a.m. in the old days, and that's a bit late for me. So, um, I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm usually up fairly early in the morning. So the first thing is to get a scan of what has happened around the world. Um, things specific to the companies, things generally. Um, and then from there, the uh, regular, regular day starts because in the morning around, I mean, four, by 4 a.m., Europe has begun. The day in Europe mm-hmm. has begun. So you have scanned through the information you reach through. I mean, I certainly tend to like to read. I mean, there's four or five papers usually, FT. New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, in Canada, the Globe and Mail. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, if Barron's has any updates, but that, that, that's a rough spectrum. That's the, the regular daily kind of stuff, yeah? Um, and then the day begins. I mean, uh, you you know, what happens during the day happens during the day. You're there, you're live. And right. uh, it's, it's uh, you try to organize your life with as minimum, I don't want to use the word distractions, but probably, yeah, to manage your focus on what's at hand. Because a number of the things that you read about, you learn about, you'd ideally like to, when you're, after you read them, digest them and think about them. And without sort of cluttering your day with stuff. So, uh, I mean, I, 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 this, is not a, this is probably not going to come out sounding right or nice. But, you know, one of the things about uh, the world of the era of COVID uh, you know, people just dropping by to the office diminished. I mean, that's clearly true. I mean, also since we went to the office, but the, the 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 Zoom calls, I think, which were fast and furious in the earlier days, have become you know fewer. And we we tend not to encourage people to you know for anything to just call. I mean, you just send us an email. Well, we're we're very diligent about responding to emails, but uh, so you try to maintain some. Uh, so a day lacking clutter, basically. I mean, um, I mean, I, 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 I don't mean to be dismissive. People, people are wonderful. People come with all sorts of uh, thoughts, ideas, and so forth. But by and large, you do need some degree of quiet. I so, agree, and COVID yeah. has created boundaries. Um, yes. I think, in many ways, even though we've had much more information to digest, it has allowed more time for focus and and reading. I'm the mom of two young girls, though, so I almost never get um, peaceful time. But I I do want to turn our interview right now to international markets and more specifically emerging markets. Um, These markets have significantly lagged the U.S. for over a decade now. Um, I feel like we talk about it every year here at our company to investors. And you've been investing for emerging markets uh, for decades. Does the current pessimism or neglect in emerging markets um, get you excited about prospective returns? What do you think about EM? So, so I've, you know, without making some sort of judgments about a, a broad, a given broad market in, by, in and of itself, you, um, you buy individual stocks. Yep. And I will come back to the dichotomy between markets and individual stocks. And, Sometimes there are periods when things look so ridiculous that you feel the need to do something. When I say this, so many opportunities come at you. Uh, and then let me give you a case in point, a historic case in point. One, it was in 2013. We had the taper tantrum. Yeah, Ben Bernanke uh, made noises that he was going to raise rates and you know, various countries. So, for example, in, in you know Turkey, the currency completely fell apart as they had then, as now, a somewhat irresponsible uh, monetary policy. And, of course, that fell apart. But more interesting, India, this is before the Modi government was elected, India was engaging with what something it periodically does, very capricious tax tax behavior uh, vis-a-vis foreign investors. So people would be hit with massive back tax bills, like massive. We're talking billions of dollars. 
You know, for example, when uh, Vodafone uh, bought Touch Telecoms holding in the the, the, the the cell company, mobile company, they got smacked with a very large bill, a very large uh, back taxes. So th- there, was, there was a huge fear. There was a huge fear about who would get hit next. And uh, foreign direct investment, FDI, slowed down to a crawl. Basically, the only money that was coming into India at that point in time were the portfolio inflows. Now, remember, portfolio inflows can be very fleet of foot. They can come and they can go. It's very easy to come in and buy stuff. It's easy to come and sell stuff and they pull your money back. So then comes Bernanke with this proposal that he's there's going to be raising, he uh, gives indications that he's going to be raising rates. And then happened the taper tantrum. The taper tantrum the Indian currency cratered. It fell apart massively. If I recall, this is from memory, but from the mid-50s to the mid-60s per dollar, which was quite the move, quite the move. And of course, all sorts of stocks cratered. I mean, this was like a big gong. You go, you have to do it. This is too, too, because India has some great, great companies, like very interesting companies. But the, from my, by using my yardsticks, it's usually quite expensive. And so we're quite wary about buying these things. And so what we bought, and we bought, we bought lots of stuff in India then. So that was an example of a time when things got suddenly very, very cheap. Now, fast forward to the present. Say, let's say post-2009, 2010, broadly speaking, uh, you've seen some sort of, I don't want to say divergence, you've seen this is post the GFC, what has done really well has been lots of stuff in the United States, the U.S., for example. It's done very, very well. Um, not, not, not all the financials, but most, a lot of the U.S. has. Again, you have to discount for the composition of the U.S. markets. There are some absolutely brilliant large companies in the United States, but the, the valuations are quite Quite, quite, quite pricey. They're quite pricey, and then on the on the heels of them, people looking for the the next whatever, the next Amazon, the next winner take all kind of companies. I mean, all sorts of things have been bid up. Some may merit those valuations, some may not. Uh, in in any case, these are not the kinds of things we have uh, an appetite for. Holding <laughs> certainly not the way we invest. So you had. You had uh, the U.S. take off, given the mix of businesses it had, and also the U.S. came out of the GFC much faster than the others. I mean, uh, if, you know, look, I, I, it irritates me uh, no end, but you know, the, the, but this extraordinary excessive valuations over here. But that mm-hmm. said, there's a lot of really decent companies here. I mean, and we also came out of the GFC faster than the others. It, the country operates as one country most of the time. You know, most of the time. So, uh, whereas Europe, you know, there was a tussling went on and on and on about how to come out of the GFC. Anyway, so Europe was sort of behind. Asia sort of, you know, because the individual countries came out. China did actually quite well. Now, this leaves out a lot of other places. It's notably the emerging markets. They they have the mix of businesses does not sort of generally have the kind of appeal until recently, until recently. Now you see this massive boom in India and Brazil in these um, more technology centric companies where technology mm-hmm. can actually be used in financial services and retailing and all sorts of things. And you really are seeing massive, massive investments taking place. And that's how, that, that, that is, I think, developing. I don't want to use, to an excess, but I think I think excesses are probably developing there. We'll see. I think we had the first gagging in India of an IPO, okay, and it sort of keeled right over. I think it was uh, yeah, it was quite something. I think Paytm is the name of the company in question. So anyway, so you had that mix. So you had a sort of pecking order. Emerging markets now, okay. So in the recent past, so you've had this going on for a while. You had. Um, the thing that has happened now, akin to a discrete event, but this is actually multiple events. Now, in Latin America this year, uh, the last, let's say, last 12 to 24 months, you've had a lot of discomfort take place. A lot of discomfort, specifically uh, Chile uh, saw riots in 2019. Uh, 2020, you saw... Uh, you saw first round of elections. You saw another round of elections. And of course, you know, it seems that the established order is going to have to change. 
Um, before I comment on what I said, I should probably. Then there is also in Peru, you also saw an unexpected upset in the new president. And of course, the people who believed in everything should continue as it has for X years in the past, it, they were screaming, my God, the communists have arrived. I, I think this is hyperbolic. It really is hyperbolic. I mean, you know, there, 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 is, uh, there is a city country divide. And I think in, in, in all fairness, some form of uh, uh, a more equitable distribution should evolve over time. Although, I, that's, I said, in the case of Peru, the country has probably done more than others. But, you know, the, the, but this caused a huge upset, huge upset. Uh, so we also have elections coming in Brazil and Colombia this year. In Brazil, the, the, the president is uh, remarkably unpopular. He has uh, he has views which are not just controversial, but sometimes define define common sense. I mean, uh, you know. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and Colombia, the fear has been uh, that the new person in power may be much more to the left than the people historically accustomed to. And Colombia has historically been a very pro business country. So that's a spectrum. So there's upset has happened because of the elections that have happened. And now there's more elections coming. So there's been massive discomfort across the continent. And, you know, people are talking about taking their money out. And you've seen the manifestations of that in a number of things. One, uh, Chile is one of those markets which has historically always been very expensive. Why has it been expensive? Because they're what they call the AFPs, the pension plans. The pension plans, as it turned out, were a very big repository of people's savings that people did not have access to until, of course, they retire. However, in the period of COVID, when people started losing their jobs and the economic economy keeled over, the government allowed people to start withdrawing money from these things. I think there were three tranches that have happened so far. And one of the things that has resulted in that is there's been massive amount of selling, selling of local stocks, which I think is interesting. So for the first time, the Chilean stocks locally have been sagging. And to compound things, people have felt that they should invest outside the country more. So the currency has been sagging. So historically, a very strong currency, a very stable currency has been sagging as have been the price of local stocks. So that's Chile. Peru, similar thing. You've seen a lot of, you, you, you have slightly, they too have had withdrawals, but they've also had money flying out of the country. Mm-hmm. There's all sorts of people, Peruvians, who uh, historically have had assets there, have been trying to find ways to you know, sort of take them out of the country, scroll them away elsewhere, and so forth. Um, similarly, in the case of Colombia and uh, Brazil, I mean, Brazil, you'll notice the exchange rate has been, uh, you know, weak. I mean, it's been weak across the board and stock prices. So, you know, you look at this thing and say, okay, there's perhaps some merit, some fear. There is uncertainty. In you know, for example, in the case of Brazil, in most of these countries' cases, the falling current currency has resulted in inflation rising. And in most of these countries, pretty much all of them, they've started to raise rates. In the case of Brazil, they've been quite aggressive raising rates and quite fast. And they're at it and they're at it. Okay, so that has happened. This, this is therefore a period of some discomfort. Mm-hmm. So what, what does this say to us? So, you know, just one very uh, – it's a very simple-minded observation. Now, th- as I said earlier about uh, the comparison of foreign direct investment uh, compared to portfolio investors, one is there – is sort of like, – I don't want to say – it's like a tourist. You come and they'll go. The other right. ones are there. And you, you build a bridge. You build some infrastructure. You're there. You're not – you can't just yank the money out on a whim. So what is interesting, you've begun to start to see large chunks of new money arriving, but serious. I mean, as in, I don't want you, I don't want to say that their money is any more real than the portfolio investors, but maybe this is longer term money. Uh, let me give you two examples. Um, in Chile, um, you know, there, there's a very, the, very lo- the largest Brazilian bank, Itaú. Itaú has a subsidiary called Itaú Corpanca. Okay, they'd, they'd acquired a part of, I think they had about 30, 40% of uh, Itaú Corp Banca, and they have decided to invest in it, raise fresh capital, and use the capital raised because they also have a branch system in Colombia, use that to 
completely take it in mm -hmm. and uh, increase the quality of the balance sheet, improve the quality of the balance sheet of the uh, Chilean company. So Itao has raised, I think, a couple of billion dollars right there uh, for this bank. The second, which is, uh, I will confess, a surprise, and I, I'm delighted. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you why it's a personal note. Well, what happened in Colombia is Colombia over the years, as the market has shrunk, because companies, good companies have been taken over. And there's, there's a number of reasonable companies, decent businesses, but there's a lot of cross-ownership. The, the stocks got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper over the last five, six years, to the point that uh, they were, I think, foolishly valued, like really, really stupid cheap. I mean, um, and the, com the thing about these companies, they're holding companies, and they're trading at massive discounts to their net asset values. The only thing st between them and some a hostile person coming and doing something to them is there's a cross-ownership, which makes it very difficult to do. Okay, mm. So at the very least, at the very least, what you could see is, look, the company, the the, co the company in question. Let me let me, let me name names here. Uh, Grupo Suramericana is a company that is a holding company that has controlling shares in the largest bank of the country, Bank Colombia. Okay, it owns a chunk of the largest food processor that has about a sixty percent plus of the market share in the processed foods market. It owns. Um, a piece of the largest cement producer in Colombia, uh, Caribbean. Uh, uh, actually, they also have uh, operations in Florida. And, uh, and they also have a Latin, pan Latin American uh, pension, pension fund manager, pension plan manager, and they own an insurance company, the largest non life and life insurance company in Colombia. Okay, so this became, and uh, until let's say, Q, at Q3, it was trading at about 40% off book value. Now, if you, uh, you do a mark-to-market -market thing, it was trading at oh, less than half of half of a mark-to-market. -market. And the insides, the underlying securities were also similarly very cheap. So I reasoned, I said, look, I mean, look, this, this company, logically, uh, you would expect a, a, a hostile uh, acquirer to basically take it apart. And sell right. off the pieces and, you know, uh, have quite the payday. However, it's not going to happen. Well, was, was I wrong? Was I ever wrong? In came uh, an acquirer who went for a partial bid. Uh, and it looks like as a Friday for two of these companies, namely the food processor, as well as this holding company, these are billions of dollars worth of cap, fresh capital that's coming in. Okay, in one case, he's, his partner is the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. In the other case, he's doing it on his own. He's a very wealthy man himself. He's also Colombian. He is also in financial services. He owns a bank there. I think the fifth largest bank in the country. And so you're actually seeing a, a, for a real uh, fixed in, interest, uh, fixed long-term uh, uh, invest, investor, investor interest coming in. So that that is, to my mind, the first signs. So they con Itao con confronts the new government. You know, is going to be faced by the new government in Chile, whatever that may be. Uh, the guy, the person who's investing in Colombia, similarly will be faced by the unknown new government uh, in Colombia. That's later this year in October, November, when the elections are held. And so it's gotten to the point that these things are cheap. Very, they look very, very cheap. So on a broad market basis, I mean, there's opportunities there. There really are opportunities. And it's amazing that notwithstanding this, people are still fleeing. Well, I mean, that's a really great example of your bottoms up approach. I know that you describe yourself as being macro aware, and that certainly yes. came across in the way that you answered that question. I hear you speak a lot about survivability in your businesses which is a really focus on financial strength. Yes. Um, much like valuation in international markets, this factor has been overlooked by investors for some time due to low interest rates. And even more recently, Federal Reserve willingness to buy corporate debt at the outset of the panic. panic. 
With corporate debt the highest on record as a percentage of GDP, do you see trouble down the road? Well, the short answer is yes, very likely. Uh, so being mindful that one of the byproducts of having this kind of issuance of debt, uh, you, these low rates induces issuance, basically. You know, look, uh, at, at a 3% rate, I could handle $100 million. At a half percent rate, I could handle a lot more debt, my service. You know, presumably, of course, the, you, you sort of kick the principal down the the, the can of the principal repayment down the road, and we'll just refinance it. And to date, uh, the borrowers have led a charmed life. They've been refinancing and refinancing at ever lower rates. This, of course, has emboldened them to get crazier, I think, over time. So we've seen that actually initially. Just to give you a sense of, just let's go outside the U.S. for a second. Uh, emerging markets, historically, emerging market borrowers historically face very high rates. Very high rates. High, there was always this massive, they call the EMBI spread, the spread over U.S. treasuries. Right. As the U.S. treasuries plummeted, uh, those went down. And of course, as the yield hunger spread, that spread shrank. So there has been wild borrowing. And I, I used to use, and I've historically used Turkey as an example of this because there was a lot of fixed investment that went on in Turkey. Turkey went in a wild real estate binge while building a boom, a huge boom. And of course, they borrowed. They borrowed mm-hmm. in US dollars because that was the cheapest, deepest market. I mean, it was, it was fabulous. They borrowed. And unfortunately, the, the product that you're selling is not hedged back into US dollars. You earn your money in Turkish lira. Mm-hmm. So they said the rates are so low, it's so much cheaper than what we'd invest in, what we would get here. And of course, you know, then of course the results were quite dire when the first taper tantrum happened. So coming back to the to North America, in fact, it's more than just North America that's going to face the problem, because there have been lots of U.S. dollar issuers, uh, mm-hmm. in across, not just in developing markets, in developed markets, and also, of course, in the United States. So there are certainly going to be massive trip ups. Hard to see where, what scale it's going to be. Uh, it's. Anybody who has any a wit of risk aversion should be out there figuring out ways to sort of plan for the scenario developing. Maybe that's being that's too pessimistic on my part, but I think one should always plan for adversity. You should always have I would I don't want to call it an escape route, but something that allows you to make it through the crisis uh, in, mm-hmm. in in some plausible shape. It's not obvious. But on the other hand, the question, of course, is will this precipitate opportunities? I think so, yes. However, however, now what are the opportunities that are, could be of interest? Now, the problem is the scale of the borrowing has not escaped people's attention. So people have raised large funds to come after and either replace the debt you know, it's one of those kinds of things to uh, buy, to own. You know, one of those kinds, mm-hmm. the people who will swap your existing debt and be financier and then, of course, take over the company on the cheap. So there's that kind of stuff that is already getting talked about and being prepared for. So it's not obvious. I mean, it's not – the nature of the opportunity is not obvious. So the one thing, I mean, I will say is I, I am wary about is – I have an aversion to debt-laden companies. I have mm-hmm. a great aversion to debt and the balance sheets of the companies we own. So um, I suspect the fallout, if, as, and when it occurs, will probably there be some throwing out of the baby in the bath with the bath water. In that, you'll probably see some decent companies get tarred in some fashion or another. Decent mm-hmm. companies are companies with assets that are liquid, liquid, liquidatable, liquefiable, saleable assets. So the balance sheet gets back on site rapidly. So we'd have a decent balance sheet company. So it's hard to say exactly what shape this thing is going to take. This is a bit, bit more of a market call than I am capable of doing and willing to do, make. I mean, uh, it's hard mm-hmm. to guess the shape of this kind of thing. But yes, the upset will be there. The, you know, so, but that said, Many emerging markets where you thought you'd think that there'd be something happening, they've already begun to raise rates quite rapidly. So the kind of 
the drama that we had during uh, 97, 98, or financial crisis. crisis. That was mm-hmm. my, my, my trial by fire <laughs> uh, when I set out on my own. Or you need the tequila crisis. So many of those markets are not quite as vulnerable now as they mm-hmm. used to be in the old days. So that's a good thing. But exactly where the opportunity strikes will be interesting. But look, uh, the world is our oyster. And we're, I mean, I'd love, I, I, I mean, I wouldn't wish ill on anybody. But more opportunities, good opportunities would be obviously welcome. Yes, they would. It would be welcome for sure. So if you had to say one thing that keeps you up at night right now, what is it? Is it, um, you know, U.S. dollar denominated debt and some of these international companies like what what is keping you up at night? So U.S. the U.S. dollar. So the, the funnily enough, the U.S. dollar um, the currency mismatches have always worried me. Okay? Mm-hmm. Currency mismatches have been the root of many sort of disasters. The tequila crisis, for example, the Asian financial crisis, for example. You've seen the blow-ups in Argentina, for example. You know, So those kinds of things have happened. Now, the U.S. dollar, interestingly enough, uh, in the, expect, this, the expectation, the baseline expectation is we are going to see a succession of rate hikes. The U.S. dollar is going to go up. I mean, that, that's the baseline. Maybe that happens as people expect it to, but the world has a way of going exactly the opposite way of what people expect it to. So uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. So that, that probably is not the thing. I think, I mean, uh, not, not something that keeps me up at night, but something that I'm watching with keen interest. Now, uh, let me name two names of two co- countries that are wildly mismanaged. The companies, not so, but the countries, yes. Argentina and Turkey. Mm-hmm. They've both been profligate. They both had net negative reserves, it seems, foreign exchange res- reserves. Um, they both seem to be, at least as of now, uh, reluctant to be sensible. Yeah, for example, both of them are deeply negative interest rates. You know, Argentina, you know, after all the huffing and puffing that went over the uh, IMF last week, and the IMF said, you will have to have positive real rates. Well, the, the interest rates, they were 28%. Inflation is running at um, over 40 or something like that. Uh, so, I mean, the, the, the gap is over 10 percentage points, I mean, which is complete madness. So they raised rates by two percentage points to 30%. 30% nominal race versus 40%. So, you know, th- th- this is, th- this is good. the reason I say that this, you expect a thud of some sort here is because they have a very large principal payment in March. Oh, in March. Yes. So uh, they, a few years yeah. ago, they had the oversubscribed, yes, uh, yes. right, century bond. Um, oh, yes. That was, right? a previous, that was a previous government. Yeah. Now, the previous government portrayed uh, itself as being uh, prudent, uh, uh, investor friendly, and so forth. This current government has made no pretense of being any of the above. They will, you know, they are basically taxing. They 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 they're spending more than they tax. Uh, they 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 they're, so basically the, there's a massive deficit, and of course the problem with this is the money went flying out of the country. They're running out of foreign exchange. They were trying to squeeze people uh, to not you know to take the money outside the country. There are all sorts of schemes. I mean, look, Argentina has many years of experience. Argentinians have many years of experience of spiriting money out of the country. Now, uh, they are. I think some years ahead of Turks. I mean, Turks also have experienced hyperinflation. I mean, the pre- earlier governments. And so Argentina is probably first in line for some sort of episode here. Uh, so it's not, I'm very curious as a shape of this uh, thud or oh, this, this, this hitting the wall episode hap takes place. Uh, Turkey is similarly will experience something. So these are the interesting companies in those two countries, the companies are battle hardened. Uh, maybe we'll get them cheap. Maybe we'll not. I mean, uh, Argentina has fewer and fewer and fewer companies over the years, and they're very, very carefully watched. And I would argue the investors there are quite bright. I mean, this is this is like investing in India. You're either in there, and you have very bright investors with whom you compete to buy things at the correct price. Uh, otherwise, you shouldn't be there. 
if you can't do it. It's just, it's a tough place to invest. It's, but there are some really interesting companies there. Uh, Turkey, similarly, battle-hardened companies, you know, companies in many cases over the years, because a debt bar, le- the leveraging was so expensive, you have reached the Turkey, you've had reached the Turkey, which have no debt on their balance sheet. They've outright cash ownership of real estate and good real estate in that. So, so there are things there which may become interesting, um, but I wouldn't say this is stuff that keeps me up at night. Um, uh, more, what may keep me up more, at, maybe things closer to home. Actually, uh, I, I think there's a lot. The one thing that causes discomfort is the extent to which the country seems to be run on a partisan basis. Mm-hmm. That there's a lack of dialogue, constructive dialogue. And that worries me. That worries me. I mean, there was, uh, I, the, you know, I think COVID has basically uh, ripped off some bandages even further. So, and that's, that's painful to watch. Mm-hmm. I agree. That worries me, I suppose. It also worries me. I mean, well, if, you take it, if you take it to an extreme, it could be messy. Sorry. I, 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 no. But, but it's, it's an obvious statement, but yeah, that, that sort of worries me more. Well, I mean, is there anything else you'd like to share with investors today? Any other information you want to get out or any other views we haven't touched okay. on? It's something that we feel strongly about. I mean, uh, I mean, a lot, a lot, a lot of this we've learned, and you know, Morris, to some some ways, has the imprint of Marty, in all sorts of funny sort of ways. You know, for example, just the two two small things. For example, when I first visited Marty's office, this is probably during the 1980s, well before I started working there. It was upstairs uh, in a nondescript, probably a grade B or grade C building on Lower Madison Avenue. It was about from upstairs from a bookstore, uh, which is fine. It was fine. It was a very simple, unassuming, nondescript kind of office. And he said, you know, why do I need any of I, I you know, what's I, I want an interesting place to read, work, be with people I want to be with. And this this it was a small firm of four people at the time. You know, fast forward 35 years, Morris is uh with nine of us, and we, we are also, I think, probably grade B or grade C kind of office, and we're in the, in the garment district, in an office oh. that works uh, in New York, it, it's uh, in the mid-30s, uh, half of being Penn Station and uh, Port Authority, which is not the most fancy Tony real estate you could find, but it's great. It's great for us. I mean, uh, it, investors' values matter, and we're long-term. And we want to be there in the long term for investors and we focus because long term really matters both in terms of your security selection and your risk aversion. Because remember, if you're very short term, uh, the stuff that can happen is relatively bounded. Interest rates can go by half a percent, one percent. If you're quite long term, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, interest rates can go up by two, three, four, five percent. So you have to have a different kind of risk aversion. And long term sort of matters to us uh, because, as I mentioned before, that's how you buy really cheap things. So there's the cheapness and then the survivability. And this links into the kinds of investors that we have historically, uh, you know, sort of, I don't want to use the word worked for. I mean, we've co invested, but it's probably a more correct thing because we eat the same thing. I mean, we invested ourselves uh, personally. That is, you know, being protective of our investors in a really long-term perspective is something that I'm not saying it's a dying thing. It certainly has been um, um, sort of, I don't want to use the word under attack, but it certainly has been less popular of late. Mm -hmm. Uh, We may be swimming against the tide. We're going to find out. So I, I agree. I think, um, you know, at our business, we look at providing value to investors through a number of mechanisms. And you really have to consider yourself a partner to investors and in providing value across the front. So um, it sounds like you've built a wonderful firm with a great culture. Um, and I do really appreciate the time you've spent with us today. Uh, it's been an hour, and I know your time is very valuable. I certainly couldn't have afforded an hour of your time. So thank you very much, Amit. 
Oh, no, no, I should be thanking you very much. I mean, I appreciate the time that you've given me today. Uh, and, well, and it should obviously be patient. I mean, as I ramble through, it's been, it's obviously been a serious stream of consciousness rambling. But thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate uh, your having taken the time to uh, learn about Morris and our experiences with Marty and our investing. Thank you for listening to the Zinvesting Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any questions or comments, please visit our website at zinvestingpodcast.com. Happy investing and stay zen. As you know, investing is inherently risky. You can lose a lot of money. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Nothing in this podcast should be construed as a recommendation to buy or sell any particular security or invest in any particular sector, industry, or country. Do your own homework and be careful out there.